You're listening to the Bird Dog Babe Podcast with my mom, Courtney Bastion. This episode is presented to you by Purina Pro Plan and Boss Shot Shells. It's about having fun. And it's not about trophies. And trophies are great and trophies are good. You know, something to strive for, but that's not what it's all about at the end of the day. Going out and having fun and making memories and enjoying yourself and enjoying what you're doing is way more important than trying to impress somebody. So I just returned home from the Ducks Unlimited Expo, and it was an amazing time. If you guys didn't get there this year, be sure to get it on your calendar for next year. I believe it's going to be held in April of 2022 in Texas. Uh, It was awesome to be able to get to meet several of you listeners and supporters of the podcast there that stopped by the Purina Pro Plan booth. Uh, Purina is big supporters of Ducks Unlimited. And what's really cool is that they're coming out with three additional 3020 sport performance formulas that are co-branded with DU. In July, you'll be able to get the turkey, duck, and quail formula, the bison and beef formula, and the salmon and cod. So be sure to check those out. It was great to catch up with the crew at Boss Shot Shells. They were teaching people how to pattern their shotguns at the demo range and showing them the difference that copper-plated bismuth makes on paper. If you aren't already shooting Boss, go get yourself some. Pattern your shotgun, take ethical shots, make clean kills, and keep lead out of the uplands. Patreon patrons, you guys rock. My awesome partners at Dakota 283 are offering a giveaway of one G3 kennel and a Dine and Dash. And I'm keeping this giveaway exclusive to you. If you're a Patreon patron and you have written a review of the podcast, you're entered to win. Or if you aren't a patron yet, join now at patreon.com forward slash the bird dog babe. I'll be drawing for the winners on September 1st. If you haven't had a chance to try out a Siren shotgun, be sure to look at SirenUSA.com for a demo center near you, or look at some of their upcoming events that offer the opportunity to shoot one. At many of their events, there's even a gunsmith on site for pit stops and service. Be sure to try out one of my favorites, the Tempio Light, Tempio Sporting, the Elos D2, and the Waterfowler. My guest today is Jeff Lemonis, who many of you refer to as Lumpy, of Lumpy's Kennel. I've known Jeff for over 15 years, and he is one of the best trainers in humans you'll meet. Jeff has trained nearly any type of working dog you can imagine. Pointing breeds, flushers, retrievers, hounds, terriers, you name it. If there's game to be harvested with some dog work, Jeff has most likely trained a dog for it. He has recently focused his breeding program and personal hunting dogs with Spinoni and the Bracco Italiano. With so many of you requesting an episode about the Bracco, you will surely love this one. There's a lot of great advice in this episode and some real hard belly laughs. All right, let's get after it. Well, welcome to the podcast, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm stoked to have you. So... I want to know. So first of all, I always call you Jeff and I don't know if that's, if that's how you prefer people call you because your nickname is lumpy. And I feel like there's gotta be some kind of a good story behind that. Is there, is it worth sharing? The the story goes way back to uh, deer hunting camp. Um, When I was um, 14 and 15 years old, back in the day when, uh, you could go to the bar with your dad and shoot pool and horse around up at deer camp. And, uh, my younger brother, um, looks a lot like Eddie Haskell and he's a very good pool player and he was playing pool with the locals and, uh, they were picking on him and, uh, he came over and he told him, he says, if you guys don't quit picking on me, I'm going to get my big buddy lumpy over here to take care of you. And <laughs> from then on, they started calling me lumpy and that's just the way it's been for a long, long time. And uh, <laughs> that nickname kind of stuck with me. And I started naming some of my competition dogs. 
um, with that preface with, with lumpies. And mm-hmm. so when I went and ran dogs and the people would look at, uh, you know, at, at the running orders, they would see, you know, lumpies real red or lumpies whitey or, you know, lumpies dog, you know, and everybody started to know, you know, who they were and, and, and who ran them. So. That's awesome. And you've, you've been doing this for a while now. So I know like when I got started in 2004, you, you were already established on the scene. So tell me when exactly when you got started and and kind of how that came to be. Well, I actually got started back in 94 is when I started to um, go to Cadence Kennels and I met Dennis Brath and Gary Hansen and uh, started to uh, do some training there. And I was interested in the breed, the small Munsterlander. Mm -hmm. And I wanted one and I had to talk to Ned and June Singpeel and I was able to get a female small Munsterlander. And it was kind of the beginning of my training career it, it's one of my one of my proudest um, accomplishments is I took that small Munsterlander and and trained with Dennis and Dennis did a lot of the training and I just participated and 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 helped out and learned as he was training that dog and uh, she ended up being the highest scoring female small Munsterlander in North America at one time wow. and her biggest accomplishment was Dennis had short hairs and he was very proud of his line of short hairs. And I still have dogs from that cadence line here at Mm -hmm. my kennel and all of his clients. He had a big competition, like uh, a small Nastra event, a shoot to retrieve event that was scored and judged, but it was just a a fun trial at the kennel. Mm -hmm. Well, all of his other clients that had his short hairs, um, were there and competing and I had a small Munsterlander and uh, I ended up winning that day with that small Munsterlander and beating all of Dennis's short hairs and um, you know I got a belt buckle and I still have that belt buckle and that's my one of my most pri- prized awards um, was uh, was winning with that with that small Munsterlander and that's- uh, that's awesome. And if people know Cadence Kennels at Prefix for short hairs, they were some pretty damn awesome dogs. Yeah, so, they're very, yeah. very nice dogs. Yeah, so that says a lot. Is that what you started in was Nastra? Um, like when you started to compete? No, I was. I, I started in NAVDA first. Okay. NAVDA with the small Munster Lander and then AKC with the short hairs. Um, mm-hmm. You know, right at Cadence Kennels. And then, and then moved on to, to Nastra. Okay. Have you done, um, any field trials with them, with any of your dogs? No, I I haven't done any walking field trials or any horseback trials. Okay. Just, just to shoot through trees. Yeah. So out of, out of those, the AKC, the NAVDA and the Nastra, um, I guess, I guess kind of a split question, like which did you enjoy the most and which of the systems did you feel like really produces good solid dogs that you like to hunt behind? Well, that's a loaded question because it is (laughs) each each of those venues offer, you know, a, a different thing for those dogs, you know, obviously, you know, the NAVDA, really produces a very versatile, well-rounded hunting dog. And uh, it, it's a great program um, with a lot of water work and duck work and, and things like that. And the AKC is is a good experience, and it's a lot of fun to get to that master level and go out there and, and, and figure out how to get that dog around the course and what it takes, you know, to get a ribbon that day. So. Mm-hmm. Both of those, you know, are, you know, judged to a book standard and, and, uh, they're fun, but they're not really competitive where when you step into the ring with Nastra, it's pure competition. And, 
it's one of those things, you know, it kind of makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I love that competition, but I only like to do it if I have the dog that I know that has the opportunity to go out and win every time I put him on the ground. I don't like to go and it's not a social event for me. When I run Nastra, I'm going there to win. And it, you know, it's just a totally different thing than, than the NAVDA or the AKC. Right. Right. And, a, and a different dog, you know, those dogs, um, you know, they're built for speed, nose style and, uh, you know, obedience to the point where, you know, it's not a broke dog steak and there's lots of things you can do, you know, to take advantage of the situation that you're in with your brace mate in order to better your dog or to show it in a better light in order, you know, to gain the most points that day, because there is only one winner that day on that mm -hmm. field. Besides like what's being asked of them in the different systems, um, did you notice difference in structurally and, you know, temperament wise between, between the systems of the competition versus the non-competitive ones? Well, I think you needed a dog that had a very, very competitive edge, a dog that was, that really wanted to go out and find every bird in the field. Mm -hmm. And it's a, just a little bit different. I mean, structurally, um, they're they're not a lot different than okay. than than the other dogs it's just it, it's more of a a different mindset i mean it's only a 30 minute run so okay. you know but to have a dog that's in great condition that can run hard for that 30 minutes that's not sucking air through its mouth at the end that's still breathing through its nose to dig out and find that extra bird that's out there, you know, that's really important in Nastra. Right. Right. So how did you go from starting in bird dogs to like the different areas that you ventured to? So, I mean, you've trained dogs for, gosh, I mean, so many different areas of just working dogs in general, bear dogs, um, right. Coon hound, yeah. um, the, the, uh, is it Yag 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 Terrier? Yeah, Bachtel yeah. Hound. Yeah, right. So, um, I mean, talk about some of those different those different breeds and those different types of working that you've trained for. I enjoy a dog that's designed for the activity that I'm involved in, especially you know some of the specifics with the hounds, from a rabbit dog, a beagle, to a coon dog, to a bear dog. There's so much beauty in those hounds because they're a little different than a bird dog. I mean, when you, when you have a bird dog, 90% of the time they're in control. You have some control over them. They're, it's kind of, it's like a team where they're, you're working together. With those hounds, when you take them to a bait and you turn them loose, they're on their own. They're going to go out and they're going to strike and they're going to drive and, uh, they're going to try to get that bear treed and there's not a whole lot of interaction, you know, that I can do to, to help them at that point until they've got the job done and they're finished and it's treed. So right. it's pretty neat. And, and that's, so they're just completely independent at that point. They're not looking at where's, where's my owner, where's my handler trainer. They're just, they're on a mission and they're not coming back until they have their job done. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and, and it takes a special dog to be able to do that. Right. I, I'm thinking like the relationship differences with that. I mean, are, are those breeds, um, you know, what's their attachment differences to you as their owner and trainer compared to the bird dogs? Are they like less cuddly, um, more difficult to live with? Can you explain some of those things? they're not, they're not different in, in any way. Those, hmm. those houndsmen um, love those dogs and take care of those dogs um, just as well, if not better than the bird dog people. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Th those dogs live a little bit different lifestyle because they have to live a little rougher because, because they have to hunt rougher and mm -hmm. that's just part of it. But a true houndsman 
will do anything for those dogs. What about the the little ones? How did you get involved with those smaller breeds that are little killers? <laughs> I just like them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they're just they're just fun to have around. I mean, they're they're you know they're 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 part of my business with with all my bird pens and in that respect in the varmints and things like that. They have their job most of the time. They're out and about. And they're somewhat independent and they're patrolling and hunting and doing their thing. But yet they're always kind of up to something and uh, willing to, you know, hop on the wheeler and go for a ride or uh, sneak out in the field and uh, steal a crippled bird here and there. And, uh, you know, just (laughs) they're just fun to have around. I I just like their personalities, their tenacity, and uh, they're just kind of... uh, (laughs) I guess some of entertainment, but yet they serve a really useful purpose. Right. And I think that that kind of goes for all the dogs that you have, because you, you do hunt a lot of different things. Like what, what do you all hunt with your dogs? Wow. Um. (laughs) (laughs) Loaded question. (laughs) I mean, anything, you know, from, from rabbits um, to, multiple upland game species to waterfowl, you know, here the Horicon Marsh right here in the fields, you know, to the West for, for the waterfowl aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And the Bavarian mountain scent hounds tracking wounded game. So, you know, that's uh, a lot of tracking during bow season and, and deer season. And, uh, And then the bear dogs, which uh, I don't own any bear dogs right now. Um, I would go up and I have a friend up north, you know, that had a big string of dogs and I would go up and, uh, and participate with him starting in July, training season, July and August, and then kill season in September. Hmm. Um, I wouldn't be up there the whole time, but I would try to get up quite a few weekends, especially during training season. That's a lot of fun especially with those bear dogs. There's, there's not a lot of pressure. You're not trying to uh, tree something, you know, for, for somebody to fill a tag. You're just, you're just running bear to get those young dogs going and, 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 and to get those, those older dogs in shape and get them ready for the season. Mm -hmm. So you're training pointing breeds, flushing breeds. um, Let's see, bear dogs, the hounds, the go to ground dogs with, with all of this, I mean, as a trainer, you, it, it's incredible. I mean, just, just that in itself to, to be able to figure all those out. I mean, I know a lot of people that can't even comprehend the difference of going from a pointing breed to just a flushing breed. So of all those different working dogs, what are some similarities that you or foundations per se that you instill with all of them. What what do they all have in common with your with the approach that you take in training all those different types? Well, I guess temperament number one. You know, you need you need nice dogs. I don't like mean dogs or ugly dogs. I, you need nice dogs, and and then well-bred dogs, dogs that are able to complete those tasks and, and, and do what you're asking of them. And then I guess a good work ethic, a dog that's willing to, to work every day, something that, you know, that you don't have to beg in order to come out of the kennel or to train. Is there like a foundational um, command that you make sure all of them know, like whether it's come, sit, heal, or all of the above, is there something that every dog that comes into your kennel that you make sure they leave knowing this thing? No, because they're so, they're so different and diverse, you know, I mean, with the, with the pointing dogs, the wool work for the steadiness, I mean, that, that's the main thing. And then sit here and heal for the retrievers, and the flushers, that's their foundation. And for the hounds, 
a recall to where when the day is done that you can get them caught up. That mm-hmm. That's really important. And building drive, I mean, regardless of what breed it is, I'm sure you've had dogs from all those different working types where you need to build that drive sometimes. is Does that look differently yeah. or is it a similar approach? I think, well, th- there's different techniques for all those different breeds, but it's really important. I believe that, you know, that four month of age, four months of age, when they're still hanging around dogs, they're not turning into teenagers and gaining all that independence. It's important to show them at that stage of their life, what their job is going to be and introduce it to them properly. I call it a puppy course. And it's, I think it's the best course in the life of the dog to get that young pointer acclimated to birds, getting him searching the field, using his nose, pointing with instinct. And as he steps in, that bird flushes in a nice chase and a cap gun in the distance. And then eventually with no sensitivity with the cap gun, you're, you're shooting a few birds for him at that stage. And you kind of show him the whole hunting world in a, in a very fun, but yet structured uh, setting with uh, really no no commands or no pressure whatsoever and, and let those natural instincts bloom. And I think that's important in the pointers and, you know, the flushers and the retrievers, getting them quartering and then shooting some birds for them and getting them in the water. And then the hounds, I mean, obviously they're not going to chase a bear when they're four months old, mm-hmm. but to uh, catch a coon in a live trap, and, and, and show them that coon and uh, let that coon snarl and hiss and let them run around that live trap and get excited and bark and bay at that coon. And then eventually let that coon loose and hold them back and then let those young dogs just trail and run and bark and tree that, that coon. That sticks with them their whole life. I mean, that's, that, that's what they were bred for. And you're just popping out those natural instincts. I think that's really important. Right. In your perfect world, when would you like to get those young dogs in for training? At what age? Well, it would be nice if um, when they're 12 weeks old, 10 and 12, 13 weeks old, that the owners would stop by and just pick up a dead bird and, and let those young dogs pick up and carry and enjoy that bird. And then somewhere between four and five months old, I think is is the, one of the the best times for the puppy course, just because you know I said they're they're hang around dogs. They haven't they're not big and mature and fast and independent at that point yet, and they're they're kind of like a sponge. They're soaking everything in, and uh, I think that's I think that's a great time between four and five minutes to have them, right. but just for a short period of time, you know, two weeks, really no more than that. Okay, so it so two weeks you like to have them for that like that kind of younger introduction. And then when after that? Mm, then they go home and grow up. And okay. uh, usually when the people will call me and say, hey, this dog is starting to get a little crazy. I, it's not listening near as well as it used to. And that's usually somewhere between six and eight months of age. And it okay. depends. it depends on the dog and it depends on the breed. But when you do the puppy course, you can get a pretty good idea And have a pretty good benchmark of, you know, how much drive, how much desire, and how much maturity that dog has throughout the puppy course. And then you can kind of, uh, you know, make your plan for that full-time training. But usually it's somewhere between, you know, six and eight months of age. Um, Some of the breeds I'll wait a little longer, 10, 11 months. But it it just all depends on the dog. Okay. And then how long do you like to, to keep them at that point? Usually they stay for eight to 10 weeks then. Okay. And, and then, so do you want their first hunting season to happen after that point or, or when, when do you like them to have that? Do you wait till they're completely broke to have a hunting season or do you try to push them at that younger age? It all depends on the owner. And it all depends on the dog. And, you know, each dog is custom trained and each dog and each owner have different goals 
for that dog and have different ideas and different views. I know I try to give them my best opinion when they say, Hey, this young dog, um, it's really not collar conditioned yet, but I want to take it out to South Dakota and put it on some birds. And I always tell them, you know, that that's fine. Go ahead and do that. I said, but don't expect the world out of this young dog. It's just, it would be an experience for that dog to travel along and go out there. I said, but really next season is going to be its real first hunting season. So to answer your question, I like to have them collar conditioned and I like to have them wool broke. So at least they don't have to be broke all the way through wing shot and fall, but, but broke enough to where they understand how to handle their birds properly. And if you need to, you can make some good corrections in order to keep that dog in a, in going in a positive direction and not snowballing backwards where it's ripping birds, taking birds out, chasing and just creating bad habits and in a bad hunt. Mm-hmm. Um, so I guess that's kind of the answer to that question. Yeah. And what's your, what's your personal insight, you know, just you, when you go out hunting, I mean, you take several trips, will you shoot birds that your dogs don't point? No, I mean, uh, but not in a, not in a strict or a snobby kind of way. I mean, if that dog's hunting and, and it's wrong winded, on that bird and that bird wild flushes and that dog spins and stands steady to that wild flush. I'll shoot that bird for that dog because it's, because it's handled, it's handled that bird. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's how I, that's how I look at it. If the bird is handled properly, I'll shoot that bird for that dog. You know, when you say, will you shoot birds that aren't pointed? If that dog is tracking and then all of a sudden just rips forward and takes that bird out, I'm not going to shoot that. I'm not going to shoot that bird for that dog. No, because it it wasn't handled properly. But on the other hand, if that dog works that bird, works that bird and is slowing down and, 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 and working that bird and, and, and not quite pointed yet. And that bird takes flight and it's a big rooster. And that dog had, you know, tracked that bird for 40 or 50 yards. Yeah. I'll shoot that bird. That bird was handled. Yeah. Okay. Explain some of the reasons why, um, why you don't take that shot if they're, if they're just jumping in on it and flushing it, not handling it well. What are some of the effects that happen to the dogs when you give them that reward? Oh, wow. Well, it's, it's just, it's improper. I mean, it, they'll, they'll start to take advantage of that. And, you know, pretty soon they're, they're working birds ahead of you and just taking them out and chasing and i mean if if i can't stop a dog and if i can't make a correction that dog's not going to be in south dakota hunting with me so Mm -hmm. i mean uh, i want a dog that understands its job and if it makes a mistake i want to be able to correct it in a positive manner so the dog learns from that experience and becomes better and not snowballs and gets worse right but, and do you think that that comes to, I mean, with like the different stages of being a hunter, you know, maybe when you first started or if for the people that don't get to go out hunting very often, you know, and they take that, um, one trip a year somewhere and they're, you know, they just want to get the birds in the bag, you know, they're, they're jumping at that shot regardless. Have you found that? I mean, maybe whether it's with you know, people's dogs that you've trained or, or people that you've personally hunted with. And you're like, well, why'd you take that shot? If the, you know, the dog's not pointing it or not properly handling it. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I don't really, I don't run into that very often. I mean, I, I, I guess like, like I said, each, each person is an individual and if that if their dog is in the field and they're killing birds and that makes them happy regardless of how that bird was handled and they're having fun and they're happy i don't have a problem with that but if it goes the other way and they go to the game farm and they put 10 birds in the field and the dog runs out and basically takes out 8 of them 
and the birds fly to the other field, that's when I get a call and they say, Hey, you know, what can we do to get this dog? So it starts to handle these birds properly. You know, I, I had 10 birds out and we only killed two. Right. It took eight of them out ahead of us and they flew to the other guy's field. And then the dog comes back to you and you're fixing that for him. And then you're telling him to stop killing birds that he's not handling. <laughs> right. Start making some corrections and, <laughs> and uh, you know, don't, don't shoot that bird, make that correction and, and, and go on and, and, and work another bird. And if it's handled properly and things are starting to get better, hook back around and then go hunt that bird that wasn't handled properly. You, you'll still have a chance at it, but let that dog give that oppor- that dog an opportunity to do it right. The venture that you've been through, I, I think is just so cool. All the different types of dogs you've trained, the super competitive ones. I mean, you, your dog Whitey, I mean, isn't, he's like a, he did a ton of stuff. He's like a record breaker or something, isn't he? He was, he was an eight time champion with, yeah. with Matt and uh, he won high point dog in Wisconsin. Um, I don't know, for a whole bunch of years in a row, I got a lot of belt buckles <laughs> and uh, I won the Wisconsin regional with him a couple different times. And uh, he was just one of those dogs that, that loved to win. And, uh, one of the, one of the very few, the, the highest, the highest you can score on a find is a hundred. And most judges won't give a hundred. They'll give a 99, but they won't give a hundred because they're always thinking, what if I see something that's a little bit better? And, uh, there was a couple different times when, when Whitey scored a hundred on his finds. So wow. pretty impressive. impressive. Yeah. yeah. Was he one of the most special dogs you've ever had? Oh, I had a love hate relationship with him. I mean, <laughs> he was special because he loved the win, but he was like flying uh, a jet fighter. He was mm-hmm. either going to go out and absolutely conquer and win, or he was going to crash and burn. One of the two. He mm-hmm. was a dog that lived on the edge. And uh, I'm not afraid to admit it. I mean, there were times when the world wasn't big enough for him to hunt a 40 acre field meant nothing to him. And, uh, I would end up catching him up, you know, five miles away from the trial grounds. <laughs> Those are my favorite dogs though. I, I gotta tell you <laughs> the ones that are on the edge, you know, I mean like the cooperation is shit usually. Right. But man, are they fun to hunt behind? Yeah. If- if you can have find that happy medium ground with them, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. In, in, in that competition field. Yes. But, uh, out in South Dakota hunting wild birds. Well, that really wasn't his forte. I'd much rather have my Spinoni named time out there mm-hmm. in, in South Dakota. And she has no business running Nastra. Totally two totally different dogs. Sure. And that's where, I mean, is that, that's where you kind of landed. You are, you have gone down this path now in the last several years with the Italians. You have the, the Spinonis and the Brocky now. And uh, which, which I think is awesome coming from the super high powered short hair line and the, the bear dogs and the coon hounds and some pretty hardcore retrievers. Um, and, and now you're, you're you're settling with the Italians, <laughs> <laughs> and you love them. I do. <laughs> I really, really do. It, it, it's so cool. It, it, and you just dove deep, like trying everything with them. I mean, you know what? Our national heck, you even a uh, friend helped you out and t- taught you how to do some confirmation with them. And man, you were out there just winning ribbons. I, I loved it. I'm like this. This bear hunting dude is out here showing some dogs now. It's it's pretty badass, Jeff. It's uh, it's important, especially it's important in all the breeds. But you know, this is my first go around. You know, with the confirmation, and I think it's really important with the Spinonis and the Brocos. And I actually enjoy it, and I like to look at all those dogs, and. Uh, I enjoyed my time in the ring. Um, it's probably not the best place for me. I'm probably better in the field and meant to be in the field, 
but mm-hmm. I did enjoy it. And, uh, and, uh, I learned a lot and, you know, I'll continue to show dogs. I have, I have big plans for some of these dogs. That's awesome. And super exciting. So we, we have to get into this more. So the going from these high powered dogs to, to the Italians, I mean, your, your personal, your, your training with them has to have veered somewhat, if not substantially, would you agree? Yes. From some of the past methods that you've used? Yes. Okay. So, so tell me your, I guess, you know, maybe with time, time was your first Spinoni, right? Yes. So was anything different with her? Um, or how did you kind of learn? Like I, I need to learn something different or I need to change the way I'm approaching these guys. First of all, time was very, very talented from the very beginning. And she showed that to me and she didn't make my job any easier, but she was very talented and very good in the field from the very, very beginning. It's one of those dogs that you just knew was going to be a special dog. And I think knowledge is the key to understanding how to train the Spinonis and the Broncos. Um, I spent a lot of time with a lot of different dogs. And if you know some things, you don't have to work quite as hard. And you don't have to use the different methods where those methods involve some pressure and, and you can, you can tailor your training. So those dogs understand what you want, but yet in such a structured way that they respond to it very positively. Mm -hmm. Are you, are you finding that you have to like that a bond is critical with them before you even approach any sort of pressure at all, or even, I can't even say pressure, just getting them to respond. Yeah, it's really important. And, uh, you know, they're, they're very, they're very, they're kind dogs and they're somewhat emotional and, uh, but they're always happy and fun loving. And I think that's a good way to really build that bond and, 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 and bird work and field work. I'm extremely lucky because I have a training field in my backyard. I can take a puppy out or take a dog out at any point in time, any day of the week and take it out in the field and let it do what it was bred to do. Search for birds, run in the weeds, jump in a pond and do all those things. So I think that's really important. And that's kind of the way I build that bond with my own personal dogs. And especially with these Spinonis and these Broncos is uh, give them that environment. And uh, I think it really helps um, to build that bond in that respect. Mm -hmm. And what about the level of patience with them? And, and I can't, you know, speak for the Spinoni, but I just think, you know, with the level of patience I take when I'm working with the Bracco, it's, um, you can't get frustrated. You, and you have to work them through it. And, and if you can't get them through it at that moment or that session, you got to be able to walk away and then come back. Um, would you agree or do, or do you personally continue to push through until you get the behavior that you want from that session? Never. I agree with you a hundred percent. Okay. You have to, you have to, well, as Dennis Brath taught me, you have to know when to go fishing. You have to know when to quit. Go into that. I, I know, I know this story. You were, you were doing, um, <laughs> right. You, when you kind of first started there, 
uh, you did a lot of the retrieve training, right? Yeah, a lot of the retriever training, a lot of the force breaking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and yeah. so what happened? When did the fishing pole show up? <laughs> well, <laughs> Dennis had a whole trailer full of dogs, and I was parked underneath the tree with those dogs, and it was my job to force break those dogs. And there was fifteen or sixteen dogs on that truck, and uh, that's a lot. And uh, as the day went on, the sun beat down and some of the dogs weren't cooperating and things just weren't going very good. And Dennis, you know, he was training on, and, and he could tell things weren't going so good. So he came over and he, uh, you know, asked me, he says, you know, and how's it going? And I said, it sucks. I said, this is terrible. I said, these dogs this one won't pick this up. I pinch this one's ear and he won't reach out and get it. This one's trying to bite me. I said, it's, it's, it's terrible. And Dennis is like, hang on a second. I'll be right back. And he goes to the truck and digs around in the back of the truck. And here he comes walking with a fishing pole in his hand. And he's like, here, here's a fishing pole. I looked at him. I'm like, how is a fishing pole going to help me force break these 15 dogs? And he hesitated for a second and he smiled and he pointed to the pond and he said, go fishing. And so that's what I did. I quit and I went fishing. And, uh, when I came back, the dogs had settled down. I had settled down and everything went smooth. And, uh, I've never forgotten that some days you just have to slow down, take a break. And, uh, let everything kind of settle in and uh, always remember, you know, tomorrow's another day. That's an incredibly important lesson right there. I, I like that method. I think that's something a lot of us can do, whether it's dog training or outside of dog training. Right. Take a break. Take a break. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What, it, what has been your experience going through the retrieve training with the Italians and I'm just using the Italians generally for both of them. If there's a big difference between the, those two breeds, you, you need to interject and let me know, but what has kind of been your experience and maybe different ways of approaches with that, with that retrieve with them? Well, I've modified my force breaking to the point where, um, I don't pinch ears anymore in order to, to get them to reach and grab um, a lot of these dogs, especially the Spinonis and the Broncos, have a strong desire to retrieve. The thing that I'm finding is that they have a gag reflex, and a lot of dogs have gag reflexes. And, and, and I've seen it where it can be either just something they have or something that's man-made. Um, seems like throwing a tennis ball, and a dog that retrieves a lot of tennis balls, when it comes time to put feathers in his mouth doesn't know how to manipulate its tongue properly in order to breathe and hold that feathery bird in its mouth where it can hold the tennis ball in the front of its mouth by its canine teeth and breathe out the side of its mouth. And it's almost like it, it almost like it uh, imprints on that dog's breathing process and makes it harder for them to breathe when they have feathers in their mouth. So I've just gone through a process of teaching that dog how to hold and how to condition that tongue when they're exercising and when they're moving in order for them to have a block in their mouth and breathe properly at the same time. And once they've accomplished and that gag reflex has subsided, when you go to the bird, they want to pick the bird up. And all of a sudden they go and pick that bird up and they toss it in the back of their mouth and they roll it around a little bit and their tongue comes out and they can breathe properly. And it's like, the light bulb goes on and they're like, Oh my God, I can, I can breathe and I can <laughs> run and I can retrieve and I can bring this bird to you and you'll throw it again for me. And there's no need to pinch their ear because they want to do it, but they just need to learn how to breathe properly. That is so interesting. It's almost like they just can't multitask. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And, and do you find a lot of the other pointing breeds can that they are able to multitask and like maybe the Italians just don't have that, that ability as much. 
No, I don't think so. I mean, I, okay. I see it. I see it with 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 all the different breeds, you know, okay. and you know, and 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 how they're brought up and and what they're brought up um, picking up and carrying as young dogs, I think, makes a big big difference later in life um, as they you know grow up and are when it when the retrieve you know turns from a request into a command or turns from playtime into a job and uh, i think that uh, you know what they were brought up retrieving makes a big difference as mm -hmm. older dogs that's a good point if you can start it out when they're young as just a game and make it completely 100 percent fun yeah and then with feathers with real birds mm -hmm. real dead birds that makes a huge difference and not frozen birds, fresh dead birds. Okay. But not with the pointing breeds, not where you're throwing it in the tall weeds and the dog is going in and searching with its nose in order to locate the bird and grab it and make the retrieve. You know, with the pointing breeds, like on short grass, mowed grass, um, you know, anything flat where the dog can actually see it visually with its eyes and go and pick it up. Otherwise, if you're throwing stuff into the tall grass and you're expecting them to go in and use their nose and then grab that bird, you'll start to suppress some of those pointing instincts and you'll start to have that dog want to go in and grab those actual flyaway birds when you want it to point birds. So you got to be a little careful with that. What about the the backing issue? I mean, like we hear often Spinoni and Bracco, they just don't back. They don't naturally back. What has, I mean, you, you've put master hunter titles, senior hunter titles on these dogs. Like it ain't no thing. What's your experience with it? Yeah, they're not good at backing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Especially the Broncos. I mean, it's just like they can't grasp the concept of, you mean, I just have to stand here and wait while that other dog is pointing and you really got to take your time with them and having them trained with, with the wool work on the flank um, or a belly collar, however you want to say it is, is, is really, really important for these dogs. because um, They seem to, they want to be a little bit clingy. They, they almost like, they want to back, they want to be closer to you. They want to come to you in order to feel that confidence and in, in, in order to stop and stand. And that's not always the best situation because that dog should really just stop and stand right when it sees that other dog on point, wherever it sees it. And with that flank collar or the belly collar on, um, when it's done properly, you can tap that button on a really low stimulation and have that dog stop immediately at a distance when it sees that other dog without any verbal commands or anything. It's just a little bit of stimulation on the flank because that's all that flank collar means. That's just strictly wool work, mm -hmm. steadiness work. And it just means when they feel that on the flank, it means stop and stand and don't move. And you just have to really kind of take your time and uh, those they'll they'll fight it, you know. They they'll do it, and then all of a sudden they'll decide, no, I just don't want to do that today. And but it's kind of a it's always a work in progress. But it's kind of neat when all of a sudden the light bulb goes on and they start to figure it out. Like, oh, all you want me to do is just stand here and wait and. I don't know what it is, but all of a sudden they just start, it starts clicking. And then they just do it. And then they just do it. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. I'm definitely not quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, that all sounds good, but Jet, she got mad at me the other day. I, I stopped her and uh, the other handler flushed the bird and shot the bird for his dog. And I healed her out and I sent her off and she went 20 yards and she stopped and she stood there 
and she wouldn't move. And mm. so I went to her and I coaxed her on. I'm like, come on, let's go hunt them up. Let's go. And she went about another 20, 30 yards and she stopped and stood there and stared at me and she just wouldn't hunt. And usually she was just ramming around the field. And, uh, I moved her on again and she stopped and stood there and looked at me and I'm like, what is wrong with you? She turned around and she walked back to the kennel. Huh? That was it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Freaking Bracco. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> we're all and done here. Then, yeah, she said, we're done. I'm done. <laughs> and then I left her put up the next day. And then the day after I took her out and I ran her in a brace and she backed on her own two out of the three times and she ran hard in the field. And it was like that other day never even happened. There was no residual from it. It was almost like it helped in a weird kind of way really odd yeah they are strange you're right do you (laughs) do you feel that they're uh like inconsistent in general or you think they just comprehend things differently more slowly i think think they comprehend things differently i really Mm do yeah and how do you how do you put the i don't know put the reason, the thing that you want done, how do you put that into terms with them the best? Well, my friend Al was riding in the wheeler with me that day that she left the field and went to the kennel and and stood up by the kennel. Mm -hmm. And I looked over at him and I said, you know what, Al, it sure would be nice if she would just have a beer with me and I could talk to her and tell her what I wanted. And he kind of laughed and giggled. And he's like, yeah, that would be good. And uh, I mean, that's just kind of the way they make you feel, you know, but you can't, you know, you just got to, you got to work them through it and and show it to them again. And uh, they're, they're different, but they're fun. Yeah. What do you think would have happened if you would have kept her out in that field and pressured her and pushed her? you know, maybe two or three more times to make her stop and and do that back. What do you think? How would she have responded? It would have been, it would have been bad. It would have been. In what way? um, I I think she would, um, I I think she would have become resentful. And I think that um, blinking would have been, much more prevalent. And I think that you'd have gotten a battle where you were trying to push her harder. And I think she would have pushed back even harder. Mm -hmm. I think letting her win and letting her pout and letting her say that, you know, I'm done today, you know, that's going fishing. I mean, that you just, I think you just have to accept that that day like that and look at that and, and go, well, okay, I guess that's all we do today. Mm -hmm. And that's so completely different from maybe what your approach would have been with a short hair or or I should say just yours in general. I mean, I think a lot of people, even, you know, when we're looking at sending, sending these dogs to trainers, knowing that you can't just, you know, one method isn't going to work for every dog that comes through your kennel. Right. I mean, it, I, it, I don't think a short, I don't think one of my short hairs would do that. I mean, where they would think that much that, you know, he's trying to, he wants me to back. And if he wants me to stand here, I'm just going to stop and stand and pout for a while. That's just not in that short hairs mentality. You know right. what I mean? They're, they're, you know, they're just, they're a lot bolder, a lot tougher, a lot more, a lot grittier than the Broncos. Yeah. Like you mentioned earlier, you said that they're emotional. I think that covers it. Yeah, they're emotional. Yeah. Yeah. But hmm. sometimes it's fun when they're emotional. I mean, when they're doing it right and they're so happy and they're floating <laughs> around that field and they're just, I mean, they're just like having the time of their life out there. And that's what's really neat when you get right. them to that. Point. Right. Because when they're on, I mean, they're out there 
with a big grin on their face, just working their hearts out. Absolutely. And yeah. it's, it's so damn cool. <laughs> it just makes you smile. You know, it just, it makes you feel good. They're, they're just, does. they're fun to be around. They're fun to watch when they're really clicking and things are going the way they should be. Mm-hmm. And before, before I hit record, we were talking about, um, you know, even because the Bracco is not well known to be a water loving breed. They, I think, you know, you have, you have several, I have several that do love water, no issues, but you know, there's just that point where they, they're not all consistently just as puppies going, Hey, there's water. Like a, you know, a German wire hair pointer puppy does like, right. like they're just born to be water dogs. That's, that's not the Bracco. Um, and so I, I loved one of the techniques. I mean, you've probably never done this technique before that you did with that young Bracco to, to help her out, feel more confident in the water. Can you, can you tell the listeners what, what you did there, what you saw? Well, it was weeks and weeks of traditional methods of trying to get her to enter the pond and swim. And she had entered a couple of times and she can swim. And I took her out in the pond and went swimming with her and she swims just fine, but she just has problems um, with her feet leaving the bottom of the pond and actually launching out and starting that swimming motion and going swimming. So after weeks of traditional methods, I ended up one day, got the idea and kind of gambled a little bit, but, you know, stretched a, a long piece of mule tape across the pond and put a carabiner on one end of the rope. Well, it wasn't on the end. It was kind of in the middle of the rope. And then my friend was on the other side of the pond and hooked the carabiner to her collar. And I just gently pulled her into the water until her feet were on the, the edge where she needed to swim. And then just gave her a pull and pulled her into the water and let her swim across the pond and just kind of guided her to me. And then when she got by me, I petted her up and praised her and, and, uh, and, you know, told her she was a good girl and all that, and just made it kind of light and fun. And then my friend started pulling on the rope and pulled her back across the pond. And by about the fourth or fifth time going back and forth, she started to enter the water and just launched and started swimming all on her own. And basically the rope was on her, but really wasn't used anymore. It was just kind of guiding her um, into the water and getting her to do it. But she started doing it on her own. And uh, it was kind of a, kind of a really big breakthrough for her, but, uh, but it was a gamble too. It, it could have gone either way. Um, but I was really cautious and really kind of monitored the situation and, uh, right. and uh, it went as good as it could have. So. Right. And I think that's something too, you know, a lot of good trainers have is that ability to read dogs. You know, if, if you had pulled over, pulled her over that first time and she was like, I'm dying, I'm, I'm dead. You know, I don't yeah. think you would have turned her around and sent her back the other way no. to do it again. No. Yeah. No. But so I you saw kept her happy. I, yeah, I saw I saw more positive out of it than negative. And so just stayed with it and it and it turned out good. And I think that's so common though, in a lot of dogs that just um, you know, that that approach into the water that they're cautious about, it once they can overcome that threshold, you know, from, from standing in there to that float (laughs) feet, feet leaving the floor is just crossing that threshold. Once they get that confidence, then they're good. But, you know, we're always trying to find that tipping point of what it's going to be to get them over that. Yep, exactly. I loved your approach. That's, that's very clever. And then some of them, just are just they're just not that good of swimmers i mean like crazy mm-hmm. may she can swim that's my oldest brocco 
she can swim, <laughs> but she'll go out and swim and she'll be swimming around. And like, she starts thinking about something else and she just forgets that she's swimming and she sinks. <laughs> what? Yeah. What do you mean? What, what, <laughs> what, what do you mean? She, like, what, what does that look like? She stops swimming? It looks like a bobber. <laughs> 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 do you have to go in after her oh once she like starts really sinking when she's like when her head's <laughs> gonna go under she starts swimming again oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> is that a frequent thing with her yeah that's how crazy <laughs> made swims. yeah oh God. does do you have any good hunting stories with crazy me <laughs> Yeah, quite a few. <laughs> she she sounds like a good time. She is a good time, but she is just a complete free spirit out there. I mean, she, uh, like she's I'll had a little bit too much CBD oil in her dog food or something. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I swear she's got a patch somewhere and you know, I swear she likes to smoke a little bit and then she just kind of does what she does, but she does it in such a way that she gets it accomplished, but it's just so out of the ordinary, you know, I mean, I'll be hunting with my buddy in South Dakota and, and May will be on the ground and, and his Munsterland will be on the ground and we'll be headed in a direction and like May will be off in the distance up on this hill where you would never even think there would be a bird, you know? And next thing you know, I'm like, Paul, where's, have you seen May? And we stop, look around a little bit. And well, there's May up on that hill pointed on a bird. And it's like, oh. May, oh, why are you, the, you know, just, just way out of the ordinary, like someplace you would never expect her to be, but she's fun to hunt with. She sounds awesome. And didn't you just finish her senior hunter? No, that was Jet. That was Jet? Okay. All right. What are you what are you up to with May right now? Well, May um is just in training for masters, but okay. you know, I plan to breed her. So mm -hmm. she's kinda a little bit on the idle right now. Okay. So. I think everybody listening to this like wants wants a baby May. I mean, I know I do. <laughs> she's, she sounds amazing. Yeah, she's a character. <laughs> you know? And you, you talk about the, the Brocco hop, um, yes. you know, with your dogs. And, you know, I have a, a big airing yard and I'll turn, you know, eight or nine of my own dogs out in that airing yard and they horse around out there during the day and stuff while I'm training. And, and when it's time to come out of the airing yard, they all come out and most of them, you know, tear around in the kennel heading for their spot. Not crazy May. She's jumping up and down and <laughs> she does this crazy. Arr, 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 and, you know, she's got to talk to me and, and, and horse around and she's just, she's a character. What a good time. Yeah. It's that Brocco hop. That's something in the breed, man. Like, <laughs> I I can go inside and I'll put Prim in a sit and I'll go Brocco hop and she just goes straight up in the air and I'll turn <laughs> around and my husband's looking at me shaking his head like <laughs> 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 yeah they're they're pretty cool I I love that you just adore these the breed too <laughs> I really do I've I've completely fallen in love with the Broncos and the Spinonis they're just mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're so special and they're, they're almost more friend like than dog like. And I just really enjoy that. Yeah. Just watching their antics. They're just such clowns. That's for sure. <laughs> oh, I wanted to ask you on the, on the backing um, that we were talking about earlier, what, what are you doing for like, sometimes people will give the backing dog the bird, like the retrieve, what do you do? What's your approach to, to help reinforce that? Never, ever, ever 
I believe not backing is a form of greed. Not backing is a dog that's thinking, why should I stand here when I can go find a bird? And so I never give a backing dog a bird. I take it even to the next level where I'll heal that backing dog out and I will not let that backing dog visit the site of the point or the site of the fall. I'll make sure that that dog goes in the exact opposite direction. And hopefully I know where the next bird is and I can guide that backing dog into that next bird and actually let it get a bird pointed and get that bird shot for that dog and let that, let that dog know that backing strictly means you stop and stand and honor that other dog and you have nothing to do with that bird whatsoever. And when you're turned loose, then it's your turn to go find your own bird. Yeah. Do you ever find that, that you have issues with them wanting to blink or are they always ready and willing to, to take that back? In my opinion, backing is like a plateau for most dogs. Um, they struggle on the upside going up the hill to the plateau and all of a sudden they'll get up to that plateau and they'll get it and they'll start to back and they look pretty good and they're backing consistently. And then all of a sudden they'll fall off that plateau and go down that slope again. And when they go down that slope, in my opinion, they have decided that standing and watching another dog get a bird is not as cool as it's supposed to be. And that's when the blinking starts. And that's when they take a look at that dog and they go, Nope, I'm not stopping. I'm going to go find a bird. And, uh, and that's when you really have to be able to make that good correction as they take that first look at that dog and get them stopped and not let them look three times or four times and slip out the back door and get away with that blinking. Mm -hmm. um, and then as they, as they go down that plateau, when they go back up and get back on top of the plateau and start backing and start doing it consistently, that's when, that's when they're complete. And that's when they're going to be an honest backing dog and they're going to back for you um, consistently without, uh, without questioning that. Mm -hmm. I like that. Let's, let's talk about another, another subject. Um, something you inspired me early on, and I don't know if you realize this or not, but just, you have, do you have four, four kids, Jeff? Yes. Yeah. So, and you were a trainer at, with the kids. And like, I know before we had Burke, our first son, it was over seven years ago. And I remember we were sitting on the porch having a beer with you and William and I were having the, you know, we were, I was pregnant and we are, no, I wasn't having a beer. Maybe. Nope. I should, probably shouldn't have been having a beer. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. You and my husband were having a beer on the porch. And I was pregnant. <laughs> um, and uh, we were, we were going to get worried of, you know, how are we going to continue on with this lifestyle of training dogs full time and, and hunting all the time and have a kid now. And, you know, you, you told us, this is what you do. I'm not sure. I remember that whole conversation. To be honest <laughs> with you. Okay. Maybe you and my husband had too many beers on the porch. <laughs> you had, you had said, um, I think it was, all you got to do is take their car seat and strap it to the back of the four wheeler. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that is cool. Yes. Yeah. But <laughs> but I think, you know, just watching watching that and 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 now, you know, Loden is how old is how old's your youngest? He's twenty. He'll be twenty one in October. Yeah. And how you've incorporated children through your life of dogs and hunting and now I mean, what, like your best hunting buddy is your son. 
and yeah. the success that you guys had, you know, even just this spring turkey season together and, and the pride I see in your face and you light up talking about uh, his, you know, his hunting stories. And it's, it's pretty remarkable. And I think, you know, so many times when we're involved in the dog activities and the hunting stuff, it's, it's a easy choice just to go, well, I have kids now. I can't do that stuff anymore. And you were one that really defied that and continue to inspire um, us to, con- to, to go on with the kids and, and keep them involved with it. Yeah. And I think you've done a great job from the things <laughs> I see on Facebook and stuff like that. It's uh well, yeah, thanks. You've done a, an incredible job, and that's uh, it's always it's always neat to see that, and uh, it'll it'll bring you great joy as they grow older. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And do you find did your did your kids do they still enjoy being involved with the dogs? Um. Yes and no. Um, okay. Some of, some of my older kids. Um. You know, they were uh, part of the bird raising, the pheasant raising aspect and putting blinders on and things like that mm-hmm. and uh, uh, cleaning kennels. And uh, uh, my oldest boy, Led, um, he designs for Ford. He lives in Detroit now. And uh, he said, Dad, this was just this Father's Day. You know, he said, you know, you've taught me a lot. Thanks for teaching me everything you've taught me. And, uh, you know, he, he basically, you know, told me, you know, thanks for showing me dog training and bird raising, but, uh, I'm going to follow my own path and I'm going to be a designer and I'm going to go and and do this kind of stuff because I really hate birds. I never ever want to do that again. (laughs) Yeah. You know, my youngest boy, Loden, you know, he's kind of totally the opposite of that. And, you know, he's completely outdoorsy and loves every aspect of it and has become uh, a very good hunter and a nice young man. And I've taught him it's about having fun. And it's not about trophies and trophies are great and trophies are are good, you know, something to strive for, but that's not what it's all about at the end of the day, going out and having fun and making memories and enjoying yourself and enjoying what you're doing is way more important than trying to impress somebody. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. And I want to know, what is your favorite wild game recipe and keep it, you know, whatever broad spectrum you want to go with wild game. I'm not specifying bird. So, cause you've had a lot. What is your favorite? You know, I think my absolute favorite and it's really pretty simple. I mean, uh, a venison backstrap on the grill, some fried potatoes, sweet corn and an ice cold Heineken. <laughs> that, that sounds amazing. I like simple, simple and good. Yeah. It's just, <laughs> just, there's just something about that when that venison backstrap, when it's just medium rare and uh, uh, you think about the memories and the camaraderie and the friendships and um, the hunt and uh and then i mean just the flavor the 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 beauty and the goodness um hmm. of that backstrap i think that that i think that has to be my favorite absolutely okay what is your favorite bird to hunt upland between upland and waterfall oh man i like to hunt them all i mean mm-hmm. they're from the pheasants to the grouse to the ducks and the geese. Um, yeah. Quail. You, you, you can't pick a favorite. You like them all. Yeah. If I got a good dog and a good friend, it, it I like them all. You okay. Bet. 
<laughs> I like it. I like it. And turkeys. And turkeys. Yeah. How do you? How are you preparing your wild turkeys? How do you like to eat those best? I just bought an Instapot, and mm. uh, my son Loden he comes for lunch every day, and uh, he shot a, a a Jake with his bow and arrow uh, this year, and uh, I uh, I diced that that breast up. I fried it in a little olive oil with a little uh, uh, Saskatchewan seasoning on it, and then into the Instapot in a nice chicken broth with a bunch of fresh herbs in it, and then those little tiny potatoes. They're really little ones. Dumped a bag yes. of the onion and then a bag of uh, those small carrots, and then pressure cooked it for an hour and a half, and uh, absolutely delicious. That oh, that man. turned tender and flavorful and those fresh herbs in there um yeah he had a big bowl for lunch today he thought that was pretty good that does sound amazing (laughs) wow so tell us how we can find um more about lumps gun dogs what's your website or can we find you on social media yeah i'm on social media i lumpy's kennels and uh, my website is lumpieskennels.com. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, for, for joining me for an episode and, and sharing all your experience and expertise. It's It's been cool. I appreciate You're it. Welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Bird Dog Babe podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, share it and tag me and someone that would benefit from listening. And hey, help a girl out by giving the podcast a rating and review on whichever platform you're listening from. Send me a screenshot of your review and I'll mail you out a Bird Dog Babe sticker. Be sure to join me on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And if you're interested in some Bird Dog Babe swag or gear that I rely on, be sure to check out the store on thebirddogbabe.com. And most importantly... Don't forget to support the sponsors of this podcast and the organizations that are working hard to conserve the birds you're chasing after and the public lands in which you hunt.